Cash Punch as I fell into a burning Ring Zero of Fire. Very poor Johnny Cash pun, but we're just going to roll with it. So who am I, if you guys don't know? I'm a security consultant over at Def Security. Great place to work, if you guys didn't know. Uh, Offsite fanboy. Is it too loud? No, you're good. Sounds good? Perfect. Why is this important? Uh, it's really not important. It kind of depends on what you're trying to get out of this. If uh, I feel like I can't, I can't look at you guys. Uh, if I'm, a, if you're like a red teamer or something like that, and you want to know what happens when you pull some code off ExploitDB and just run it across your fingers, uh, this might be important too. Uh, the main objective of this talk is to go give you guys an overview of what actually happens in kernel space whenever you're making a kernel exploit. So basically an outline on what's going to happen. We're going to go over four different kernel data structures, the KPCR, the KPRCB, uh, eThread, eProcess. Then we're going to jump into the three different kinds of uh, kernel shellcode that you're going to find. They're pretty much the three that I've created pretty much encompass the entirety of shellcode that you're going to find out there. Uh, then we're, we got some token stealing shellcode that I created specifically for this talk. And we're going to go over that. We're going to have a deep dive on that and then a function walkthrough. And then finally, we got a live demonstration on a Windows 10 machine. So some Windows kernel data structures. I've included this picture because they're not exactly the most fun thing to go over in the world, but we're going to touch on them real quick. So before I can talk about uh, the different data structures that we're going to have, we need to kind of discuss what a data structure is in the first place. So by definition, it's a particular way of organizing data in a computer so that way it can be used efficiently. I've kind of created two diagrams here so that way you can kind of get an idea of what a kernel data structure is going to look like. So the analogy that I posted here is going to be like a person, and you're going to find things like their eyes and the color of their eyes. Their personality actually points to an alternative structure because, like, as you can imagine, uh, personality is going to encompass a lot of data as well. So that points to actually what's going to be an embedded structure within it. After that, you've got things like their age and their height, which are going to be integers, and sex being a character. So we're using Billy, for instance. Billy here, he's got blue eyes. Personality is funny. That points to an alternative structure, which is his funny personality. His sense of humor is dark. He thinks his own jokes are funny. The other people think so. No, they don't. So feel bad for Billy for a second. Uh, he's 22 years old. He's six foot tall. So jumping straight into <laughs> jumping straight into some of the different kernel data structures, we got a KPCR, which is the kernel processor control region, which basically contains per CPU information that the kernel and the hardware abstraction uh, layers use to uh, just manage your CPUs for the most part. Uh, the KPRCB is actually the kernel process control block, which is essentially an extension of the KPCR. It holds things like I've included in the diagram here. These aren't the entire structures, but these are just little snippets of things that you'll find in them. So if you've ever used a program like CPU ID that just pulls hardware information and brings it back to you, you it actually just makes uh, Windows function calls to this structure, pulls information back, so that way you can view it. So the next two structures we're going to have are the eThread and the eProcess structure. Basically, they're both the same thing, but just in different contexts. One's in context of a thread, one's in context of a process. Uh, basically, what they hold is they hold a, there's one structure for every single running thread and one structure for every single running process in a system. So anytime you fire up a new process, one of these new processes is created, stored in the kernel space, and it just holds different information that the kernel needs to maintain the process. Uh, the eProcess structure, as we'll go over in a little bit, is the only structure that's completely relevant to the token stealing shellcode. So there's three different kinds of kernel shellcode that I think, three general categories that you're going to find that pretty much encompass all the uh, different payloads that you'll find out there. The first one is going to be rootkit installation, which this can happen in many different ways, but essentially what you're trying to do is store some kind of executable that's going to start stably and stealthy as well at the same time. You don't really see these too much anymore because there's a lot of protections in place uh, to kind of prevent stuff like this. Like boot kits you don't really see anymore because Secure Boot pretty much effectively destroyed that. And if you're not running Secure Boot at this point in time, then you're kind of way behind. Uh, the second one's going to be executing an arbitrary user mode payload. So as you'll find shortly, whenever you're manually creating shellcode for stuff like this, it's a lot easier to sometimes just call an alternative executable, something like uh, spawning a new process and doing something like that. It, it's much more tedious and meticulous to just create it manually in the kernel, so you would just call it alternative process. 
And the third one, which we're going to go over today, is going to be elevating the user mode process, which is essentially stealing a token from a high priority process, shoving it into a low priority process, a low privilege process, and going with it from there. So the shell code that I created for today actually looks pretty intimidating once you look at it. But hopefully what I'm, I plan to do is break it down in such a way that it provides full technical information on the methodology that I went through to create it as well as articulating the information clearly for people that don't play with this stuff every day. So a quick breakdown, I broke it down into uh, six different functions on what's going to happen throughout the process. The first one and the most difficult one to get through, hopefully I've included enough for everybody to understand it, but uh, traversing a few different kernel data structures to ultimately get to an e-process. And as I said, e-process is basically just a structure that holds information about every running process on the machine. Uh, find system, basically what it's going to do is we're going to traverse every single running e-process structure to ultimately find PID4. And if some of you guys don't know what PID4 is, it's actually the system process that holds a system level access token that we're going to steal and use for later. Then we're going to have file system, which basically strips that token that I was talking about, that system level access token, put it in the storage and use it for later. Uh, then we're going to go to find CMD. So whenever I start the initial exploit, I spawn an alternative command prompt, and we dynamically shove that process ID into the shell code. So we're going to span all the running process again, look for our command prompt, and we'll jump down to found CMD, which basically just overwrites the token value that we stole from the system process with the, uh, with the system level access token. And the final function is going to be return, which is basically just exiting cleanly from the kernel and not blue screening the system. So a quick visual on what's going to happen. This is going to be the start function in its entirety. We'll go over, go over it piece by piece, but essentially what's going to happen is we're going to start in the KPR, or the KPCR, jump to the KPRCB, <laughs> and then uh, jump to Kthread. From there we're going to jump to eProcess and we'll traverse every single running eProcess structure uh, looking for PID4. So what's the goal of the start function? Just like I just said, is to reverse various kernel structures to ultimately end at the e-process structure. Uh, the route that we're going to take is going to be the KPCR to the KPRCB to Kthread, ultimately ended up in e-process. And there actually is a reason that we started the KPCR. It actually starts at the same callable location across all Windows operating systems going all the way back to XP. So when you're creating, if you were creating shellcode for this kind of stuff way back in the XP days, you followed kind of the same methodology that you would nowadays, even in Windows 10. Uh, so in 64-bit operating systems, like the one we're going to be attacking today, is uh, it always starts at GS segment 0 hex, which sounds kind of intimidating, but it's basically just as you see it on the screen, it's just GS uh, 0. And 32-bit operating systems, it starts at FS segment 0 hex. So this is output. I'm going to go through this just for the start function for the most part, but uh, this is output straight from a kernel debugger, just as you would see it. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm dumping the structure of the KPCR. So as I said earlier, the, K the KPRCB is actually just an extension. So at 180 hex, the KPRCB actually starts. So we get the first instruction, which we start at GS0, which is the KPCR. 188 hex down from that, we end up in current thread, which is a pointer to K thread, which is where we're trying to get next. So just a quick visual on what's actually happening. We're jumping from the KPCR, jumping to the KRPCB, KPRCB, and then jumping to KThread. So now we finally want to get to the e-process structure. So once we get here, we're, we've got a pointer to KThread. Now 220 hex down. I should also mention that some of these offsets change depending on operating system that you're on. Uh, all the kernel structures are different going all the way back, so you can dynamically generate these depending on how stable you want the exploit to be, but that takes a lot more work. Um, so essentially what we're doing here, 220 hex in, you've got a process structure member and that gives you a pointer to K process. So where are we at now? So we were at K thread, at 220 hex in, we have a process structure member and that gives us a pointer to the K process pointer. The part where I might lose, I wish I would have made another slide to elaborate on this. So the K process is actually an embedded structure within E process, and it starts at zero hex. K process does within E process. So inadvertently, from getting a K pointer process or a K process pointer, we have an E process pointer. If that makes sense. So the final step in the start function is traversing all the running processes, right? So once we get to E process, if you see that two F zero hex in. 
we have what's called active process links, and that is a list entry kernel structure. Essentially what that is, if you guys are programmers or know have any idea, I'm going to explain it real quick, but it's just a doubly linked list. A doubly linked list is basically just an array that's not in one continuous block of memory. So think of it like, since the array can't be in one spot of memory and it has to be all over the place, I think of it kind of like connecting the dots and they all know where each other are. So essentially what's going to happen is you're going to have a backlink and a forward link that point to each other. And that kind of gets a little bit more clear here in this next one. So if you'll see here in the bottom, you've got an F link and a B link, that's a forward link and a back link. And if you look like, an, if you were to start at the middle process and you wanted to go back to the first process, you would follow the B link, which is just a memory address. And then if you want to go to the next one, you would follow the forward link. And that's essentially how we jump through all the running processes. So just one quick recap for the whole entire start function. If you got through this this far, then the rest of it's going to be pretty easy. Uh, you're going to start at the KPCR, jump to the KPRCB, jump to Kthread, get to eProcess, and then jump through all the running processes on the machine. So the uh, second function is going to be find system. So as I said, basically what we're going to do is we're going to be looking for process ID 4. So we're going to span all those running processes on the machine, find the one that is PID 4. Just a quick visual for what's going to happen. We're going to jump through every single one. Is this process ID 4? No, it's not. Go to the next process. Is this process ID 4? No, it's not. Is this process ID 4? Yes, it is. So we're going to jump down to the next function, which is going to be found system. So within the eProcess structure, there's a token value at 358 hex in. 358 hex in contains the token which the process is running in context of. So for process ID 4, the user that's running in context of is NT Authority System, which is the highest level local user you can have on a machine. So once we do that, basically what we're going to do is we're going to shove it to a register, RCX in this case, um, without going into too much assembly or anything like that, just think of a register as a storage space. So we're going to shove that value into storage and then we're going to use it for later. So then, as I said, whenever I first start the initial exploit, I spawn a command prompt and we dynamically dump that process ID into our shell code. Basically what we're going to do here is we're going to do the same exact thing we did when we found the system process, but we're going to be looking for our actual command prompt. So just like the other picture, is this the process ID of our command prompt? No, it's not. Keep going, keep going until you actually find ours. And then you've got, finally we found the command prompt. So essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to take that value that we had in RCX, that system access token, and we're going to shove it into the command prompt that we currently have. So essentially what should happen here is we take that system value, we shove it, in, overwrite it actually, over our low privilege token, and hopefully we have a system level access command prompt. So the final function, which is return, which I've kind of just put in here for technical details if somebody was trying to recreate this methodology later down the road, is this is usually the most difficult part of creating the shell code, um, just because the stack's not usually in the right place whenever you're trying to return, and if you return to an incorrect location, then you're going to just blue screen the machine and all your hard work's done, and you've got to start over, and it's really, really a pain in the butt for, a, uh, for an exploit developer. So I put together a quick live demonstration. Essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to use a utility called OSR Loader, which will dynamically, not dynamically, but it'll just shove a, uh, a driver into memory. And the driver that I wrote this exploit for is actually Capcom.sys. I'm not sure if you were, any of you guys are familiar with this, but whenever you play the new Street Fighter game, they ship this new driver and it's an anti-cheat. So essentially what happens is whenever, they, they made this really great idea to, as soon as you enter into the driver, it disables all protections run some code and then re-enables protections. Somebody actually discovered that there's a stack, a basic stack overflow in that, so you don't even have to worry about protections or anything like this in this case. So I wrote an exploit that uh, utilizes that same exact shell code. And basically what I did there is I just registered the, the uh, driver and shoved it into kernel space. So if you can see right now, if I do a who am I, I'm just a low privilege user. Uh, just a regular user, but if I run the the exploit, what you can see here is you got the very first thing, which is most important, which I've gone over, is going to be I spawned a new command prompt with a specific process ID. That's what's shoved dynamically into the shell code. You've got various other things that you need to interact with a driver, so anytime you make any kind of request to a driver, it's through a device IO control function, and you need to get a handle on the driver before you can do that, so that's what the second part is. 
Uh, the third part is actually using virtual alloc. It's a Windows API, so that way you can allocate space within the kernel. And that's where I actually shove my shell code. We do the buffer overflow. We redirect traffic to the shell code. Is essentially what happens. So if everything worked perfectly, which we didn't blue screen, so hopefully if I do a who am I right here, we're running as NT system authority. And that's going to pretty much be it. Just in case the live demo failed and then we had a blue screen. And other than that, I know that was quick, but questions? Questions? There you go. Actually, at this point, there really is not. So if you get into kernel space, you pretty much have free reign to do whatever you want. Um, there is some protections in Windows 10 against jumping straight back. So typically, if there was, um, if this driver didn't disable protections, run code, and then re-enable protections after it was done, I would have had to done some alternative stuff to get memory or get shell code into kernel space. Because we have a new protection called SMEP, which basically doesn't allow you to jump from kernel space straight to user land. Would uh, EBAM protect against this? EBAM? EBAM. 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 Oh, EMET. Um, actually, in this case it would, but uh, as you probably know that um, they've actually discontinued protect like support for that kind of stuff, so I'm not sure. Actually, I've heard that they just extended it too, but there are some pretty well-known bypasses for that kind of stuff. None that I've had to dabble with personally yet, but in an upcoming course, I know that there's a, I'm going to have to touch on them. Perfect. Thank you guys very much.